<coughs> Hello, fishing humans. Yes, it is fairly late at night, um, and I'm having to be somewhat quiet. Um, typically over where that uh, window with the covering is, there's a table over there, but at night I have better lighting here. Unfortunately, there's nowhere in this house that really has uh, very good lighting, but simply is how it is. So, uh, I was asked after doing my uh, drop shot concepts of a redneck to have some type of follow up video to get more specific on um, the dynamics of natural imitations in drop shot techniques. So, here I go. Now, I wrote a whole laundry list of stuff here, so it's going to be a little while. But anybody that's seen some of my videos knows that some of my typical videos are 20 minutes, so that shouldn't be a surprise. So, on dynamics of natural imitations and drop shot techniques, I have a couple categories. The first one is aquatic. Uh, what are the dynamics of aquatic? Well, we're doing imitations of but aquatics are, uh, one, already found in most waters naturally. Uh, number two, higher attraction to fish depending on which representation it is. Um, most realistic to natural diet, i.e. shad, minnows, fatheads, you know, the other varieties. Uh, lizards slash salamanders. Salamanders are, uh, it, there's aquatic versions that stay in water all the time. Uh, water dogs, that type of thing. Um, Waterborne insects, frogs and toads. Um, I'm not really uh, including frogs and toads in this per se, in, except in the fact that they do uh, get in the water, but I don't typically drop shot a, a frog or a toad imitation. Uh, there are some of the micro ones that I will use for the crappie aspect, but uh, it's fairly rare that I use those. So I really am not including them except for the fact that they are uh, an aquatic. Uh, number four, instinct already has them higher in the eating priority of all species of uh, fish because they naturally occur in the waters. So it's kind of, you know, just how it is. So that's that one. Um... And to that effect, on aquatics, pure aquatics, uh, sculpins, uh, gobies, uh, and uh, baby catfish for that matter, uh, there's some things like this uh, sculpin imitation here that I have, if I can get it more clear, you know, it's got the fat head, the flat fins, it's got the fin at the bottom. Uh, these are in kind of a uh, dark brown pumpkin flake. Uh, I got 42 of them for like 7 bucks on eBay. The guy pours them himself. Uh, that is what I would consider an aquatic. I also have a uh, morning dawn type color uh, hologram shad from uh, Roboworm. As well as the uh, typical... Uh, black to blue to uh, white shad color. Those are what I consider true uh, aquatics. I don't have a bunch of the um, the, the lizards and whatnot. I mean, I have some. Uh, I've I've used them all up, really. Actually, uh, when I went to El Salto, I used a lot of them up. So anything that represents anything that swims in the water uh, naturally lives in the water. That's what I consider a, uh, an aquatic. Um, I use a lot of these, these shads, and I'm going to be starting to use the sculpin. So, those are, uh, to me, the most effective. I mean, literally the most effective. Then there's the category of terrestrial. You know what? I'm looking away from the camera a lot. Give me a second here. Okay, so I showed you those couple of things, and I got some more stuff coming up too, under this next category. 
On the topic of the next one, the uh, header I have is terrestrials. Those are um, insect or animal alike that are not natural to the aquatic environment, but get introduced by either weather or accident. Um, they're targets of opportunity instinctually on the part of a fish. Uh, types, number three. Ants, bees and wasps, cicadas, worms of all kinds, uh, crickets, grasshoppers, caterpillars is a big one actually, um, beetles, flies, gnats, and mosquitoes, and helgramites, and also mice and rats. But I've never seen a bait on the market for a drop shot in a rat or a mouse that's been small enough that I would use it. So that's something I want. Um, Number four, almost always get uh, a much more violent strike response. Uh, I think some of that has to do with it being a target of opportunity. And in the vein of terrestrials, um, I have, I actually have some larger scale flies, believe it or not, that I will tie like a drop shot and use as a drop shot. Uh, it actually works pretty good. It's almost like a float and fly situation, but it's with a drop shot. So... I have the uh, ox blood, the uh, standard issue four and a half robo worm with the flat little knob tail. It's always been deadly, so that's one of them. Uh, these things on a drop shot are just they're ridiculous. Uh, if you get the six and six to six and a half inch, I think it is, you can bite the first quarter of an inch and it'll release more salt. I've said that in another video, but this one has kind of like a a purpley thing to it and it goes into the uh, ox bloody uh, type color on Roosevelt good god I mean just damn it's retarded how much they get hit and then um, I got a 40 pack of these on eBay again for about seven bucks they have some flake in them and I uh, soaked them in uh, coffee for a while so they've kind of opaqued a little bit, but they're a crawler imitation, and they're just a little three inch. So they're kind of a dark gray to uh, kind of a uh, almost uh, shaley clay color. Uh, really nice for, for dirtier water because they can still be seen. And in clear water, they don't uh, shine so much that they become kind of obtrusive. So that's in uh, terrestrial vein. Other things that are uh, terrestrial to me, uh, still in the vein of, of uh, worms. We've got the Yom brand, uh, the do-nothings. They can be wacky, they can be, you know, through the nose. So there's that color, which is uh, kind of a pumpkin green with a little bit of flake. In fact, the name of it, it's a Yum Ford Dinger Pumpkin Pepper Green Flake. And it shows up in the water pretty good. And in stained water, it shows up exceptionally well. And then I have uh, Yum Fordinger uh, Pearly Silver Flake, which is very uh, good clear water color. So I have kind of a variety of things. I also have these ones that I got off of eBay again that are uh, a fatter 3 inch. Uh, they're Kind of a typical shad color. They got a little bit of flake to them. They're in salt. They're embedded in salt, actually. Uh, those were uh, hand poured by an individual and impregnated with salt in the process. So those are really good as well. And I keep everything right now. I don't have a uh, a pack, uh, soft pack for soft baits. So I'm I'm keeping them uh, wrapped up as well as I can. Give me a minute. I'm going to put some of this stuff away. I'm kind of retentive when it comes to taking care of my stuff. And the thing that I would suggest, if you're putting uh, a soft plastic back in a pack, make sure that it's as flat as it can get, depending on what type of shape it is, or it will lose its shape or it'll kink, and it'll get memory. Something you don't want. A soft bait getting a memory to it is a slow death for a soft bait basically, in my opinion, anyway. 
So when I keep it in my uh, tackle pack with my rest of my tackle, I'm having difficulties this evening. Wow, never had this much difficulty. Um, when I uh, keep them in my uh, flambeau pack, it's a soft pack with hard boxes. I keep it in the front. Keeps it out of the way, keeps it good. Uh, a couple of these things I actually have in my uh, hard pack with me smaller gauge soft base for crappie and panfish so I keep them as good as I can I don't like I said don't have a soft pack yet I intend to have one though and I wanted to keep them as flat as I can they are also impregnated with salt and I have you know just a box with just pure plastics in it all of my uh, John Deere's all of my uh, uh, crappie uh, Mr. Crappie stuff, uh, Crappie Max from Bass Pro, all that kind of stuff is in there. And also my uh, custom ones that I order from uh, uh, Charlie on Facebook. He's phenomenal. Notorious Custom Jigs. And uh, all the heads that I get for those are uh, from uh, my friend Michael Harriman of Juggernaut Custom Jigs. But I'm not talking about that stuff right now. I'm talking about draw shot. So there's that. That. You'll notice I'm really, really super retentive. I, I like to take care of things like right off the bat. I don't like letting them sit around. These things are really, really super cool. They got that uh, cut and they're molded that way. The guy that made these, uh, he actually hand carved a mold out of wood and then uh, poured the plasti in it to make the mold and it's got like that natural hump that they have in those fins it's it's really I mean it could be mistaken for a uh, baby cat baby flathead you know when they're real small fry uh, any type of minnow really any type of salamander they're such a uh, a good representation that the they're gonna get snapped to hell by something. Uh, the only thing I can imagine them not getting snapped by possibly is a gill, but I can guarantee you that if there's a crappie out there that's hungry enough, they'll snap these just as easy as they'll snap any of the rest of them. Which is kind of what I'm hoping and banking on, really. Uh, but he makes so many of them that he, he charges like almost nothing for them. So I figure, well, I can't miss out on that you know and these are all in the size range that I'll I'll uh, toss out with drop shot because with drop shot are more finesse oriented um, I could do the heavy cover thing it's just not my preference uh, I've gotten some pretty decent hogs without having to do that especially with the robo worms and these kind of worms so I'm really not too concerned, you know. Um, and I said that in my uh, my other one, uh, other video I did pretty recently. All right, so there's the organization. Okay, sizing of baits and tackle, bass. Um, a hooks generally a size number two to one odd circle and or mosquito type hooks. Um, I find that in the circle hooks, I really like the uh, spin shots from VMC more than the straight to the line. Because if you put straight to the line, you've got to do a, a swivel up the line somewhere or you're just going to get your line twist. And with the spin shots, they're always oriented toward uh, wherever you're pointed away from or actually pointed toward you from where you're, you're at. Um, so that's the kind of I like. Uh, as far as weights go, uh, number zero zero to number nine split shot for standard, uh, i.e. hard rigging, usually open water, uh, when you're not quite so concerned about being able to have to retrieve the rig if it gets stuck. Uh, one sixteenth to one quarter ounce ball and or cylinder weights for soft rigging, i.e. so that the weight is lost and not the whole rig line 
with drop shot, I always use fluorocarbon, uh, 48 pound for finesse and 10 to 17 uh, medium, uh, bigger gear open water and 20 to 30 heavy cover. Uh, I never use uh, braid or backing uh, with a leader. I just, I don't like it. It doesn't feel right to me. By all means, if that's something you do, do it. I know that there's braids out there that have the same diameter as even two pound line and they're like 10 pound rating. Hey, go for it, do it. I hate braid with a passion. I used it on one bait caster. I'll never use it again on any reel. Okay. Where and how? Bass and crappie. Number one, straight down. Uh, a, heavy weight to get down and quick and almost no uh, action imparted. Uh, let it pull them naturally. You know, there's current in water all the time. Uh, just the way that your hand sits naturally, you're never going to be completely still. You're going to have that bait flowing. That's one of the things that pulls them in to, to beat the hell out of it. Uh, and then B, angled. Uh, lightweight, letting it slowly glide. Uh, pulls the instinct bite. You know, it's something... It's cruising around and it's not too concerned. It's an easy meal. That's kind of the instinctual thing that comes in. That's on bass and crappie. Crappie and pan... Excuse me. Crappie and panfish specific. Uh, number one. Down and cover. Lightweight. Let it slowly come to them above so they see it first. Uh, crappie and panfish typically look up. Uh, bass do to an extent, but bass are more apt to look and follow something. Whereas with panfish, if it goes past them, they may not necessarily chase it at when it gets out of their line of sight, unless they're really aggressive. Uh, number two, angled cover, i.e. stumps, logs, trees, and rocks. Light as weight as you can, as you dare. Allow time for the response. It will happen. When you get something near cover... Uh, and you know fish are in an ambush mode they will come out and obliterate whatever it is even if it's just coming out an inch so that's another one uh practice let me get some ther theoretical discussion after this number one pools if you have a pool or you know someone who's willing to give you time on theirs use it test all of your weights, baits, hooks, lines. See how your choices work together. Uh, practice a lot. And I mean a lot. I'm talking thousands of hours. On the water, in pool, at the local pond. I don't care where it is. Give yourself time. As long as it's not interfering with your life, with your family, or anybody else. Uh, take the time to do. I mean, seriously. It, it makes a huge difference. Um... I was kind of lucky in that uh, my dad and my mom always had uh, a pool here in uh, the valley here in Arizona. And um, I used it a lot. Uh, you know, back in the day, I was primarily a crankbait and spinnerbait fisherman. I really didn't know a lot about rod actions and whatnot. But the practicing in a pool, that's something that carried over into my adult life. So I do it a lot. Uh, and make sure of it. Um, every time I get a new bait, I'm usually over at my parents testing that bait out, usually. Unless I just go to a pond. Uh, my dad still lives there, so I have that possibility, and it's really not that big a deal. He doesn't mind. So, going back to the lines a little bit more. Um, with my finesse, I don't go above 8 pound ever. I, I typically stay at six, right between four and eight. I want to have a little bit of limberness and not have stiffness associated with my line. Um, the two reasons that I like fluorocarbon is that they don't have nearly as much stretch as mono. I used to be strictly a mono user until I started learning the incredible benefits of fluorocarbon. Um, and it sinks really easily. So my baits, no matter what weight, is associated have a tendency to, to uh, drop quicker naturally uh, to that end one of my favorite small spool uh, brands to get because I usually buy bulk on eBay I usually get 3,000 foot spools or better 
um, or excuse me, 3,000 yard spools are better. Uh, but when I run out, I will go to the store and I will pick up Berkeley's uh, Vanish. This is the six pound, uh, this is the clear. It was a 250 yard spool. I've got maybe 80 yards left on this because I put it on two different spools. As a matter of fact, just to uh, come to my point with uh, the line as line as I can get uh, and afford to use because I do mostly light cover and open water. I use six pound or eight pound max on my medium heavy. Um, that's typically for uh, life bait, and that's but that's a whole other whole other thing. Yes, do I use light bait with drop shot? I do, but that rig is specifically for uh, bigger bluegill and shad type light bait. The other line that I like. I'm not really a big fan of the way it handles on a spin rod, but it's strong as shit. And that is 6 and 8 pound Izor line triple X uh, single strand copolymer. And it is a copolymer mono. So it is monofilament that's been coated with a copolymer to be more like. Uh, fluorocarbon. Not, it's not quite. It's got a little more stretch to it. This is more along the lines of what I use when I slip bobber. But there's times where I slip bobber with a drop shot. So, you know, it depends on what I'm doing at any given time. So, we get into the philosophy. I like... And it didn't always used to be like this. When it comes to finesse, I like to do as little as possible to get the most effect. Now that doesn't mean being lazy. It has nothing to do with energy efficiency. It has to do with the fish getting the reaction from their natural instinct and inclination to eat. Because they all have it. They all have to eat. That's, that's how fish survive. So. They're going to do it at some point in time. When it comes to things like uh, bait balls, uh, small schools of uh, fish like bluegill, if I see them on the sonar, I always want to go either just above that school or just below. I want the field of vision for my bait to be separate from the rest. There's a lot of people out there that put them right in the middle of the bait school. You're not going to get bit as much that way. Because you're not getting it in the face of the fish to where they see that it's separate. If you make it to where it's separate, they think it's injured or lazy and they eat it. It's that simple. They're very primal um, animals, these uh, fish. Um, all fish to an extent are, uh, I'm not talking bait fish of course, but all uh, fish that eat bait fish or eat natural things uh, on a larger scale are pretty much in some way predatory even if they're prey to other fish they still have some predatory instinct to them and I found that if I downsize my baits uh, like I'll even get taken uh, bigger baits and uh, heated them up with a lighter and remolded them to make them look completely unique I've done it ever since I was a kid for bluegill it, they will get pommeled you got to trust me on that. They will get annihilated if you do the right stuff. They really will. Um, I, and I, I do things in a way that most people will not. Uh, some of that has to do with, uh, you know, I have an autistic way of thinking, which is different. And um, it's just a thing that's natural to me because it's just the way my brain works. I'm very retentive with the way that I set things up. But I like to do things just enough different that uh, it separates what my presentation is in the water. Like for instance, even with the spin shots, I will not go above and one on, and I will not use the wide gaps. I will use the standard uh, uh, one on spin shots and just at the biggest, the one on wide gap, that's it. The rest of the sizes, I won't, because they have bigger ones. Um, I know Gamagatsu and a couple other companies are making spin shot type uh, hooks now but their soils are way too big for me 
I like as little of a presence of the tackle in the water as possible. I want them to see as much of the bait as possible. So I always have a longer tag end uh, for my finish weight than most. Now, one of the things I'm going to show you right now. I like adding spinners, like beetle spin spinners, to uh, the bottom of a jig head, like a Zika rig, like I've shown in another video, or on the bottom of a spin shot, to give a little bit of flash to bring a fish into uh, whatever the light bait is. So here's one of the, now I consider it still a drop shot because I have the weight further uh, than other parts of the tackle. But in this case, what I'm doing is, it's kind of, you know, in between a bait setup and a drop shot kind of, because there's still weight at the end of it with the spinner. I'll take my uh, line and I'll get two of these size uh, zero uh, split shots. They're real small, they're for float and fly. And I'll go down to the spin shot, okay? This is a number four. And then I go to one of those blades like this. So what's gonna go happen, really, this thing's hanging there. I'll usually have a pretty decent sized fathead minnow on this. Now I have this sitting there, either dead drop to cover and pop it so that this is moving. And if the minnow is moving, it's already moving, so it's got the flash or I'll troll this. But if I troll it, I put a number five split shot above a little while, uh, maybe three or four feet. I throw a bunch of line down below the boat uh, it, while we're trolling on number one or two, and then eventually when it becomes tight again, you know, it's down, you know, 10, 15, 20 feet, uh, what have you, depending on how fast we're trolling. At any given time, as far as my experience goes, um, you know, with the brush piles being, you know, 20 ish feet or so, depending on, on what lake you're on, they'll hang in between that stratum. So, if you're at the, the tail end of that toward the bottom, that's where the bigger ten fish tend to be because they'll come up and they'll, they'll hit from uh, below where the smaller fish will just get in the school and start eating whatever bait fish they can get hold of. It's a deadly rig. So I, don't even, I would encourage you uh, to do something similar. Um, the other thing that you can do, even with these spin shots, is get those really, really tiny um, bobber stoppers. Let's see if I have any in here. No, I think I put them all in my pack. Anyway, I get um, these little micro bobber stoppers that I use instead of those cloth ones. But what you can do is you can put one on toward the front of the hook, okay? And then you'll put yourself uh, the spinner and you'll put it on uh, without without the uh, split ring, just straight to the swivel, okay? And you'll put that other one in front of it. The fish won't really see that because they'll have the bait fish on here that they're looking at, but then you'll still be able to put that uh, weight down and have yourself your drop shot. Or you can put that bower stopper on, put the blade on like this, and then put the other one on and pull it to the back of the hook so that it's not going to have any potential hooking up on the drop shot part at all. Okay, so now you've got the bait fish on there and right below it's the spinny, almost like an underspin. People don't normally think of these things, but they're deadly. They are truly deadly things to do. I'm telling you, I, it's opened my eyes a lot. I've had some really good success on these type of things. I truly have. So, uh, yeah. Um, but this is kind of the reason that I like uh, the spin shots as my normal hook of choice. I know that I can get regular mosquito hooks and pretty much any type of hook and tie a swivel further up the line and do a, a standard polymer, which I hate that knob, by the way. I despise the polymer. <clears throat> I just don't like having to tie it that way. Uh, you know, even when I, I'll give you another example. If I ever have to, you know what? I'll actually use two pieces of standard line. I'll take this because I'm going to use that. 
All right. I want to demonstrate this so you see what I'm saying. 1700 yards pool. I don't mind a few yards being lost. When I used to use braid, and I used to do leaders, and even when I used uh, tied leaders to my fly line, I, I didn't even use the pin things for the fly uh, line. You know, you push straight in the... the no, I, I didn't mess with that. I didn't use any of those fancy knots to join them. And I'll show you what I did. I used to take my simple... And I don't know what the hell this knot's called, so please don't ask. Get my, you know, four to seven times. Depends on how you feel. Pull, tag, put it through, hold on to it. Now usually this has tackle associated with it, so I'd have to be really careful. Use my tongue. Okay, get this through, pull it tight, and then I would take this one. Go ahead and get it taut a little bit, not all the way, and then switch gears to the other side. And yes, I did this with braid to regular mono and, and fluorocarbon, and I never had a failure on it, not once. Right up to each other. Just like, well, if I can get it in the camera view, good gravy, it doesn't like to focus. Right there, see that? Just like that, as simple as that. And I've never, ever had that fail. Um, I have found when I make knots, regardless of knot type, whether it's Palomar, whether it's what I call a simple, I call it a simple cinch, by the way. I don't know what it's actually called. There's only two knots I ever use. I don't like the Palomar. I will use it, but the only two I regularly use is the simple cinch that I'm talking about and a, uh, oh, what the hell, snow, a snow knot on my regular bait hooks. When I'm doing regular bait fishing, I will use nothing but a snow. I've never had it fail. Only time I've had failures with my knots is if I go above seven or I go below four. And then there are people that when they get heavier in line, they go with less wraps. I don't know why they do that, but they do. So, there's that. With me, um, and I've reiterated this tons of times. <clears throat> I know that there's flashy colors that work for crappie. They were for perch, they were for blue yo, uh, sauger, walleye, uh, pike, bass. I know that these things work. Even shad, American shad, people that go for them in the rivers. But as much as possible, and at any point in time that I can, there's two things that I will do. I will either catch live bait, or I will use a representation that is as close to natural as I possibly can get it. Uh, they eat things for a reason. And if they see something that's natural in their environment, but it looks like it's a little bit off, like it's away from the crowd, that's what they're going to hit. And that's not uh, arrogance of any kind speaking on my part or anybody else's. That's simply statistical fact on the part of tens of millions of hours collectively of fishermen around the world talking. That's saltwater or freshwater. By the way, you can drop shot in salt water. It works pretty damn good, but it's a lot bigger gauge. And they hit a lot harder. Good God, do they hit so hard. So, uh, I think I've shown this rig before. This isn't like the last thing I'm going to go into. Um, but I'm going to show it again just so you see how basic this is. So, on my nice, shiny new... Uh, Pal Endurance and uh, RG Daiwa combo. I have my 
one eighth ounce cylinder. I'm I'm starting to appreciate the cylinders because I've seen them in fishing and I've seen them not get stuck in the rocks. And the spin shot, of course. This one right here is a number one. I have nothing else to it because I don't need um, a swivel because I have the spin shot. But you will see that I have, uh, well, I have about 18 inches here. Uh, I've gone as far as uh, three foot, but that's if I'm really fishing suspended. By the way, this rod, it's it's incredible. Uh, it's got a really nice limber tip. It's severely well balanced. Uh, like I said in the other video, uh, I never ever get a, a spinning rod that has like the really super big first ring. This is actually about the biggest ring I've had on, but it goes to micro and it's perfect. Uh, this is six pound floral to vanish on it. Um, and yeah, it, uh, you know, I haven't actually been on the water with this particular outfit yet. I'm actually taking it tomorrow after work. Uh, my hours have changed from uh, 9 to 5 to 7 to 3.30 as of tomorrow morning. So um, that was an advantage because uh, the last job I was at, um, we were 5 a.m. to 1.30 unless we had overtime. And then it was still only 3.30 when we left because we couldn't go over 12 hours. We just could not. We're not allowed to. So I'm going to be trying it. I'm going to be trying it on uh, either uh, Riverview or uh, ASU Research Pond. Yeah, I'm not quite sure uh, which one yet. I may hit Kiwanis because I work right next to it, basically. Maybe. Um, Riverview is like only half a mile from my house. I could actually go to the uh, canal section behind um, Banner off of uh, Southern. I, I have decent luck in there with certain techniques. And I haven't tried a uh, drop shot technique in there yet, so maybe. But uh, I'll see how it goes. But anyway, um, just to hit those points again. Uh, aquatics. Already in waters naturally. Higher attraction depending on which representation. Most, rela most realistic to natural diet. Shad, minnows, lizards, salamander, waterborne insects, frogs, toads. Instinct already high on uh, eating priority. Uh, terrestrials, not natural uh, to aquatic environment, but get introduced weather accident, targets opportunity, uh, you know, ants, bees, insects, uh, caterpillars, grasshoppers, all those kind of things, worms. Uh, always get more of a violent strike in my, uh, my history and my experience. Uh, bass hooks, generally two to one uh, mosquito type two, uh, zero to nine split shot, uh, 16th to quarter ounce ball and cylinder, for soft rigging, uh, always fluorocarbon for drop shot. I never use the uh, the braid or the backing. I just don't. Um, straight down, heavy weight, quick, almost no action. Let it pull them naturally. Uh, angled, lightweight. Let it slow glide. Instinct bite. Uh, down in cover, lightweight. Let it slowly come to them. Above them, so that they'll see it first. Angled cover, i.e., stumps, logs, trees, rocks. Lightweight as you dare, allow time for their response. It will happen. Uh, practice. I will never, ever punctuate and repeat something as much as I can do this. Pools. If you have a pool or know someone willing to give you the time on theirs, use it. Please just do it. It, it on a pond is different. You, in a pool, it's so clear because it's treated. That you see everything that your line, your bait, your hook, all that stuff does. Yeah, all of it, okay? And I'm not talking weights, baits, hooks, lines, rods, reels, everything. Uh, see how your choices work. Practice a lot. Thousands of hours. I'm not kidding you, man. If you, you have 365 days in a year, if you can at least in a year's time between the water and your pool get 100 hours you're doing something wrong. Your work week alone is in in a typical job is 40 hours, 8 hours a day. That's a lot of time in 24 hours that you have to prioritize between 
family, food, sleep, all that stuff. So somewhere in there between the weekend and, and the beginning of the week, you should be able to do something. It's important to practice. It's important to get used to the balance of your rod and reel that you chose. It's important for you to get used to the type of stretch of your line, the handling of your line, different brands, different choices, different results. You know, all these things make paramount changes and are of paramount of importance for you to understand. I'm going blind tomorrow with this outfit, but I know how it balances. I have a ton of experience with ultralights, and it's a very well-balanced rig, so I'm not afraid to do it. But I'm also doing drop shot with baits that I have not used before, so I'm really going into territory I normally would not go into. Uh, and it... it it feels weird that I'm going to do it. It really does. But those are things that just take them for what they are. It's simply my experience. Uh, you don't have to quote me for gospel, obviously. That's that's not how life works. Uh, but I've had a ton of time on the water. I'm by no means am I a pro. If I'd applied myself, I probably could have been on the Bassmaster circuit. But back when I had that opportunity, I was lazy. To regret I will never uh, live down for myself but I still love the uh, challenge and I still love the sport and if it's a thing that I can impart on somebody else and I can help with then I'm going to do it every time and every chance I get that's just the kind of person I am so there you go